Hello friend, this is 8 tons of quintessential digging machine. This however is someone who knows nothing about diggers, excavators or backhoes or even the difference between them and this adventure is buying, fixing up, using in all kinds of crazy ways, fixing up some more and digging with the digger and what we learnt in between. Let's go! Imagine it, if you will, you've been biding your time, researching for years, and then the day finally arrives. Let me introduce Barry. He sells farm machinery and other stuff, and he's just made the biggest delivery I've ever received. Oh, I can't remember how quite how he started. <laughs> Okay, before we go on to further misadventures with the digger, let me back up a bit and explain how we got to this point. I don't exactly know how or when the idea for this madness first started, but I do remember first daring to utter it when we were out walking one day and Sam was like, I think that's a great idea. And so began several years of what's become known as digger dithering and digger spotting. In this time, we considered ones that were too expensive too small, too small and too expensive, and too old. We will dive deeper into what to look for in used machinery like this and how we eventually settled on this most iconic, majestic model of JCB, the 3CX. But for now, let's go to Digger Power Part 1 and look at how you persuade yourself to buy something like this or what's the purpose of it. Let me just say right now that the reasons I'm starting with here are the ones I give my friends who think I'm crazy enough already, but they're not the real reasons that I'll go on to. Let's start with the most obvious, and that's digging. This is my first ever use of the back actor and the grading bucket here, or in fact, my first time using any kind of earth moving machinery. For flattening and general landscaping tasks, it's excellent. Being able to use the back actor to pile up the material to one side and then move it with the same machine using the front shovel is huge. <laughs> this was my first time using the front shovel and it's not as easy as you might think from back up in the cab up there. It's actually quite hard to see over the top of the shovel to know what's going on. I still find it crazy to get my head around the scale of the front bucket. It fits a lot of material. It's hard to get it across, but it's very many wheelbarrow falls. I totally underestimated just how many things I'd be using this for and how useful it would be. If you follow this channel, you know that we're quite into chainsaw milling and after years of manhandling logs, the dream was this would solve all those problems and easily and effortlessly shift things where we wanted them, how we wanted them. And we have managed to do things that would have been very difficult without it, like digging logs out of the bog. As they say though, even the best laid plans don't survive contact with reality. Like this moment we realised the bucket was too big to release the log into the trailer. Harnessing the power of hydraulics is just amazing. So there was the hope that we'd be getting something a bit like an all-terrain forklift truck. So many obstacles. <laughs> but also be able to do those tasks you'd associate with a mini digger like trenching, flattening, grading, just plain digging. All things that could feed into our long-term dream of one day making our own house while also being handy around my parents' small holding.
If this is sounding all a bit like a post-purchase rationalization to you, that's because it is. The true lore of this machine was the learning adventure, the learning to take a full scoop of material. Figuring out just how high the front loader goes by crashing it into trees. Working out many different methods for grading and flattening ground with the back actor and with the four in one bucket at the front. Feeling out the ways to lift and grip things with the back actor. And of course, ways not to lift things. Getting stuck. Getting stuck again. Getting embarrassing lessons from our neighbours and learning to get unstuck. Learning to skim off and roll up turf. I know it's getting it. As well as the learning to drive adventure, I'll admit I was hooked by the mechanical intrigue of it all. In somewhat typical fashion, my favourite way to get a handle on hydraulics and mechanisms of all this kind is just to leap into some projects that deal with it. This is leading us seamlessly on to Digger Power Part 2, the joys and woes of fixer-uppery. I have the JCB workshop manual here and in fairness it's really quite good and if you have a machine this old you can expect to get to know it in quite some intimate detail. Aside from all your regular grease point maintenance that this can help you out with probably some of the first things to do on a second hand machine like this is to check the condition of the fluids and the filters. As part of the deal our man Barry had changed the engine oil and filter but the rest was as is and a few months into it the steering started going on this machine. It wasn't a terrible surprise as the chrome surface of the ramrod of the steering cylinder was pitted and damaged and that quickly tears up the seals. I've tried penetrating oil, I've tried hammers, I've tried levers. The little pin here that holds the bushing that holds the ramrod onto this assembly is just not wanting to come off. Now I'm gonna try and use the digger's power itself. Okay, <laughs> that's impressive. I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Various combos of fire, penetrating oil, levers, sledgehammers, and even a three strands of steel rope later we were finally rewarded with this method of drilling and tapping the pin and then kind of using a nut to push it out. Well, after that little saga, the cap of the cylinder was relatively easy. Once, of course, we worked out it was affixed with that wire and not at all threaded. Ah. One cool thing about the 3CX is that in general, in Britain at least, it's quite easy to get hold of spares. Although one company did send us the wrong ramrod three times in a row. True to form, no part of this yes. steering cylinder was super enthusiastic to be removed from the digger. It can be tricky to get the new seals on without damaging them unless you use the proper JCB tool like this.
After getting the cylinder back on and testing it through its full range, which pushes out any remaining air, it was all sealing nicely, but the plot thickened with this as that wasn't the ultimate cause of the sluggish steering. So here we are, I've been piddling about in it, moving it around, attempting to manoeuvre with no steering to warm up the hydraulic oil, and now we're going to leak it. I've tried to arrange it so that it's at the lowest point. The plug's just there, so we'll have a go at getting that off see what water's in there, see what comes out. That's a funny noise. Okay, yeah, that's quite bad. This is the pickup filter that takes hydraulic oil from the tank to the steering pump. We now know that if the steering starts getting sluggish, it's a possible first warning that all is not well with the hydraulic oil. The main pump that drives the rest of the hydraulics on the digger doesn't have a pickup filter. Instead, the main filter's on the return line of the hydraulics. In our case, the filter was so badly blocked it had split, even though there is a spring relief valve mechanism built into it. Either way, we were blissfully ignorant until the steering went, so that was probably a blessing in disguise. And on the plus side, while the filter won't have been doing its job, this magnetic pickup, I guess, filter was still operating, which is good. Well, I must say, after that little extended tinkering session, power steering, mighty power steering, has never felt so good. The steering hydraulics is one example, but the diggers offered us many more opportunities for this fixer-uppery learning, from fixing the seat and replacing hydraulic hoses, to the mercifully simple electronic system, to a complete renewing, stroke, fettling of every part of the fuel system, including the many strainers and filters, lift pump and injection pump. In fact, here's Sam when we finally cracked that nut. Let's incorporate some of these learnings as we plow on irresistibly into Digger Power Part 3 how to buy a digger or some good tests you can do to make sure you're not buying a piece of crap even when you don't know anything about diggers first recommendation here is to take along a notebook split it into five categories and record your observations for each of these five here's a nice test for both these categories With the back actor extended out all the way like this, you can get a good sense for how much play there is in the various joints, just by doing this sort of thing. As a bonus now, with it fully extended, you can see if that space diminishes with the engine off just sitting there. And if it does, that's a good indication there's some leaks in either the spool blocks or some of the cylinders. None of that on its own is a showstopper, but it's definitely nice to know about. Along with that nice test for the hydraulics, you're going to want to move the cylinders through their full range and check out the chrome for any dinks or scrapes like this has. It's quite common to have them on the cylinder that controls the front bucket. As you saw earlier, we had some on our steering cylinder as well. Here's another classic test. There's two versions of it, one subtle, one extreme, where you're pushing the digger all the way into the air. If all is well with the hydraulics, the back actor should find this no problem. It is best, and especially if you have no idea how to control the digger like I didn't, to get the seller to man the controls while you examine these points really carefully. While we're talking hydraulics, these machines tend to have what's known as two wire hoses. That's because they have two layers of braided steel reinforcing. 
if you can see the outer wire, they probably need replacing. If you can see the inner wire like this, they certainly do. Individually, they're not too costly or difficult to replace, but if they all need doing, that's gonna get expensive. One last word on hydraulics, get the seller to demonstrate the hydro clamps working. The little donut shaped hydraulic cylinders lock the kingpin to the main frame of the digger or release it so that you can slide the whole assembly from side to side. Turns out it's common enough for them to seize up and lock the back actor in place and if that happens they will want removing and new seals. The job's not too expensive or difficult but it does take time to get the cylinders cleaned up and a very big spanner to get them off. It's not perfect, but I think it'll have to do. The rubber seal is quite compliant and it's got multi layers, so I think it'll be okay. Okay, I think we might actually have these hydro clamps working. I'm going to try shoving it over and see if they unclamp and clamp up. As we're doing things out of order here, let's move on to the transmission. Simple way to get going with this is just to drive it around and move through all the gears. Ideally, it will go up a hill in second and push something with the front shovel in first without too much grumbling from the engine, stalling or any crazy clunking coming from the transmission. As you saw, if you live in a climate like Wales, the four-wheel drive is essential. A nice way to test this is to jack it up on the stabilizers and front bucket so the wheels can turn freely get the seller to change from four-wheel drive to two-wheel drive and observe from the outside. This is also a great place to test out the rear differential by using the independent brakes. It is a very good sign if you can do this test in all four gears in both forwards and reverse without the differential making an almighty rumbling. As an aside, if you're having traction problems, this is a way to clear the mud from the tires. Let's move swiftly on to the engine. We'll have put the engine through its paces already with the tests you've done, but here's a few specific extras. First thing to do before a good nose around in the engine is to put the safety strut down. This avoids any potential front loader crushage. A lot of this is about just looking for obvious faults like leaks, how do the filters look? Have they been changed in the last century? Dip the oil, check what that's like. Check the water. Ideally, we want to see the engine start from cold. So if you tell your seller that and you arrive and it's been pre-warmed up, you can justifiably be a little bit suspicious. Get your light out, get down, have a good look underneath for any puddles, see what you find. If it's a machine as old as this, you can expect a little bit of black smoke when you rev the engine but nothing major at all when it's just at idle. Let's look at the fifth category, the cab and the body. This is basically everything else, rust and bent out of shape bits. Have a good look and see what you think. Is the rust just surface or it, does it go deeper? With things like the back actor, it's very common for the paint to get scratched off, but the actual material is so beefy, it's just fine. If you've never checked on the price of tires this big, then you might be surprised, they're quite expensive. It's definitely worth factoring it in, considering the wear level of the tires, or for that matter, tracks on a mini digger too. Is all the glass intact and how much moss is on there? Do you need to replace the seat straight away? How many buckets come with it? What are they and how much dentistry do they need? If you find a machine that does well in all five of those categories, you're probably looking at a machine a bit newer than this and probably a bit more expensive. For reference, after some back and forthing and bartering, this was £6,500. For the UK and the sheer power and functionality you get for the amazing education in how this thing works, I'm quite happy. Take that with a pinch of salt. As you know, I didn't know what I was doing to begin with, and I'm certainly no machinery dealer.
uh, especially if you've done a fair bit of hand digging and lugging around in the past, it truly does make one grateful for the majestic engineering that goes into something like this. Occasionally, maybe even often, you still have to break out the hand shovel because using the diggers a lot like opening an egg with a sledgehammer. But when you do, you certainly do appreciate the sheer magnitude and majesty of the digger. I don't know how to conclude all this. Using a digger is equal parts fun, exciting, empowering, challenging, nerve-wracking. And a little bit humbling. For someone who considers himself, or wants to consider himself, a good friend to our natural world, I guess it's important to remember the Peter Parker principle. If you have any questions or thoughts, we'd love to read about them down below. Otherwise, thank you so much for your precious attention and we'll see you in the next one if there is a next one. Farewell.